I was uh, <clears throat> speaking to the youth in front of a fire on Friday night. And a breeze shifted and blew the smoke right into my face. And I decided to just power through. So by the time I was done speaking, my throat was pretty raw. <laughs> my eyes were burning. So I apologize if I have to stop every now and then and take a drink of water. My throat's still recovering from smokiness and strain. I don't have years of practice smoking, so. But it was a really cool evening. And uh, we had some really neat questions from some of the youth who were there about just some what we might consider kind of basic Christian understanding, but some of these youth and, and one particular youth who is new, who has just no foundation in Christian faith. And he, he asked a question that started off as um, when Jesus was writing the Bible was his intent to just teach us about Shalom. And so immediately I had to kind of stop and go, well, first I need to explain to you how we got the Bible because it wasn't Jesus himself who wrote it. Um, in fact, 66 books written by more than 40 different authors over the course of 4,000 years. And I kind of went into a longer explanation of how we came to get our Bible and his jaw just drops. Oh, that's kind of amazing. It was a really sweet moment and a pretty powerful moment and pretty encouraging moment. And, uh, even the rest of the youth group who had heard that kind of thing before, who maybe had grown up in church, many of them were still rather uh, amazed as the explanation was given about the source of our Bible. And so it's been an encouraging weekend and an exciting time to be doing ministry at Brightview. Now we've been going through a series looking at Peter and uh, looking at the life of Peter as a disciple. So we're not necessarily going through his epistles, though those will give us some insight into his life. We've been looking more at the journey that we see through the Gospels and now into the book of Acts. And I was planning to do this sermon in the summer, so I feel a little underprepared, but we're just going to dig into it. Keep in mind that Peter was last left off having denied his relationship with Jesus on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He denied even knowing Jesus. He denied that relationship. And then he, as a result, he felt incredible shame and guilt and maybe didn't even know where it was that he belonged anymore with Jesus. And Jesus wouldn't want anything to do with him because he denied that relationship. And perhaps the words of Luke, or the words of Jesus from the book of Luke were echoing in Paul's or Peter's mind. Those words, if you deny me in public, I will deny you in front of the Father and the angels. And there's Peter. I've denied him. But we learned last week that Jesus didn't leave him in that place, didn't want anything to do with him, but that Jesus actually did want something to do with, his, with, with Peter and had great plans for Peter. And so he went to Peter and restored him, restored relationship to him, gave him forgiveness and called him to follow once again. Now, following that event, Peter and the other disciples went to Jerusalem and waited in a house in an upper room, as Jesus had told them. And they waited there until the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, uh, a, a great noise was heard and a, the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples and they were filled with the Spirit of God and they began to speak. Now, the loud noise of the coming of the Spirit drew a crowd a massive crowd. And they began to speak in the various languages of the people of that crowd. Now, Pentecost is part of the uh, Passover festival season. It's only 40 days after uh, the Passover. And so there still would have been many Jews in the area from various different provinces and countries around the Roman Empire who had traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so it's not it's not unlikely or uncommon at this time of year for there to have been many people in the city who could speak different languages, who all spoke different languages. And here they heard the disciples speaking to them in their own language. So they jumped to the only reasonable conclusion they could. These guys must all be drunk. Because when you're drunk, you start speaking in clear other languages. But the Holy Spirit's presence drew a crowd. The sound drew a crowd. The people began, uh, the disciples began to speak. And then one disciple stood up amongst the 11 and took leadership and he preached a sermon. So let's take a look at Peter's sermon and the crowd's response to that sermon this morning in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 42. Starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, 
Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants. In those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself, the, but he himself, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, I don't know about you, but this little sermon from Peter has a different tone than we've ever seen from Peter before. This is a much more mature, confident Peter. And he presents a powerful sermon. And so I probably don't need to preach anymore. But I'm going to. But we see a significant change in Peter from the man who was who would just speak immediately out of his heart, sometimes out of his mind without even thinking. He just kind of said things and then was kind of amazed afterwards if he said the right thing and, and ashamed if he said the wrong thing. But now we see Peter clearly and articulately pro professing and proclaiming the Messiah. We see that he is not only, he's not now just a man guided by impulse, but he is now a man who has thought deeply about his belief and who's begun to understand who this Jesus is. You might remember a couple of weeks back when I was preaching and Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, okay, but don't teach anybody that yet. You might remember that sermon. And when I preached that sermon, I suggested that the reason Jesus said, don't go tell, telling people I'm the Messiah, I suggested the reason for that was because the disciples didn't understand what it meant for Jesus to be Messiah. They were looking at Jesus to be a liberator and a warrior and a king, but Jesus was coming to be a suffering servant, a Messiah who saved and conquered through his own death and his sacrifice. And so at that time, they were told not to te teach about who the Messiah was, but now we can see that, that Peter has a clear grasp 
of who the Messiah is. He understands now what Jesus was getting to. He understands now who Jesus had to be. He sees that Jesus bore the full wrath of God on the cross as if he were a guilty sinner and yet guilty of all of our sin, even being made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Yet the work was an act of holy giving love for us so that Jesus himself did not become a sinner even though he bore the full guilt of our sin. And Peter began to understand that. And so he begins to preach now clearly and accurately of Jesus as Messiah, not as conqueror or warlord, but as the suffering servant, the one who has died and been raised back to life. And it's an incredible message for Peter to give impromptu, without preparation, and yet the accuracy and the passion that he shares in this is significantly different from the Peter we saw just a couple of chapters ago. Peter proclaims the resurrection, and we begin to see the crowd shift from seeing Jesus as just a rabbi or a rebel who they had to, had to kill, but they begin to see him more and more as the one who is Messiah. Now, Peter uses three main evidences here. Just realized I forgot to switch my slide. Peter uses three main evidences here for the, uh, the proof that Jesus is Messiah. And they're the same evidences we would use today. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because that would get into a whole different type of sermon than what I'm going for this morning. But he does use three evidences, and I think it's worth pointing them out. See, when people come to us and they say, well, who was this Jesus guy? Wasn't he just a good teacher? Or maybe he was just a nice guy? Or maybe he was uh, not even real and he's just a myth? Or maybe he just made everything up? Peter pulls on three pieces of evidence. The first piece is prophecy. He says this was predicted. It's not that we're just making up some random guy or that Jesus just happened to fit. There was a prophecy about him and he fulfilled them perfectly. So there's prophecy. The second evidence that he uses is miracles and signs. This Jesus was a miracle worker. He did incredible things. He did things that blew people's minds. You were witnesses of them. The crowds saw these miracles. Thousands were fed on a hillside miraculously. They were witness to the miracles. They can't deny the miracles. And finally, and the most powerful of the evidence, and this is the most powerful evidence that we even have today, and that is witness testimony or personal testimony. I have experienced this Jesus. I have seen his resurrection. I have been a part of that experience and that, that place. And as a result, I can testify truthfully and honestly to who this Jesus is. He is the Messiah. I love that line in 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And the implication is that because God rose Jesus from the dead, that that identifies and confirms Jesus as Messiah. His resurrection is what confirms it. That's a powerful sermon that Peter gives. And where we're going to focus this morning is not on that details of that sermon beyond what I've just said, but rather on the crowd's response. Verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, And for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. It's incredible. The response from the crowd is actually pretty amazing. First, they're cut to the heart. They're pierced right to the heart. Peter gets through the theology and through the head and through the skepticism and the anger and the whatever else might have been going on with the crowds following that strange Passover year. 
with this crucifixion of Jesus. And he cuts through it all and gets straight to the heart. He reveals to them, this was your Messiah, and it cuts them to the heart. And they respond in incredible humility. What should we do? We need to understand that depth of humility to ask that question. Because most of us, I think, struggle to ask that question, God, what should I do? Instead, we would rather ask a question or make the statement, Lord, I'll do what I can. If it's in my ability, I, I'll, I'll probably do it. If I have the time, Lord, what could I do for you? If I have the time. Or we say, Lord, what should I do? And then once he responds, we go, ah, I don't really want to. So I'll do, I'll do something if you ask that it kind of fits with what I'm already doing. That's fine. It is so much harder to actually surrender ourselves, to submit ourselves to God and to say, Lord, what should I do? And incredibly, 3,000 people respond to the answer in the affirmative, but most of us struggle with that. But ultimately, the call of the Christian life, more than anything else, is to be obedient to God. That is our primary call. That's our primary job as Christians, to be obedient to God. And it's also the number one place in which we have failed as Christians. In this regard, Christianity has failed on a grand scale. We have failed to be an obedient people. We'll say, if I am able, I will do this or I'll do that. God, if you ask, I'll consider it. I'll consider it. What's happened to our faith? What's happened to us? What's happened to our faith in a God who says that all things are possible through he who strengthens us? But we'll say, Lord, I can't do that. It's too difficult. Or I'm just too busy. Or it's not possible for me to surrender to you in this way and obey you in this way. I just can't do it. Yes, you can. If you believe in this God who through all things are, become possible. It shows incredible humility and surrender on the part of this crowd when they ask, what should we do? You've just told us this is our Messiah. What should we do? Peter responds, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. These are two very commonly used words in the Christian circles. We use them a lot. And I think it's important that we give them definition every now and then to remind us what we mean. So the first one is repent. Now, repent can often sound like a bit of a harsh word, and it kind of is. It, it basically means to stop living the way you are and live another way. But there's also incredible hope to this repentance. There's hope because it, it, it actually communicates you don't have to keep living the way that you have been. There is another way to live. Have you been living in a way that's hopeless or empty? Are you stuck in a cycle of behavior or sin or addiction that you just can't seem to break? There is hope for you in repentance. There is hope in repentance that you actually can break away from that cycle. You can break away from that depression. You can break away from that hurt, pain, shame, guilt. And you could live different. And I'm very encouraged at Brightview because many of you have made that decision to live different, to change the direction of your life, to orient yourself not in, into yourself or into how you would, you know, seek happiness or pleasure or be stuck in a place of, of pain or a cycle of addiction. But many of you have chosen to step away from that, to turn and orient yourself towards God, to repent. But repentance is hard because it forces us to face the truth, and to step out of our denial. It requires that we stop blaming others for our sin, that we stop blaming bad luck or misfortune for our sin. It requires us to actually recognize that when I mess up, it's me who messes up. I made a choice, and I chose to rebel against God in this moment, that I chose to rebel, that I sought my own desires instead of God's desire, that I rejected obedience and I decided to say, well, God, I'll consider it. And while I'm considering, I'm just going to do my own thing. But repentance calls us to recognize 
our sin and to put the blame rightly in the right place. And to take that into our, <laughs> onto ourselves to recognize I was wrong. But that in repentance, there is forgiveness. That when I turn to God, he forgives that sin. Now I gave a longer sermon on forgiveness last week, so I'm not going to go into that again this week. But repentance requires us to turn away from sin, to turn away from ourselves, and turn towards our God. To leave a life of rebellion and make a lifelong change of obedience. Now, repentance doesn't just happen easily. It's often motivated by strong emotion. And this is why many of us struggle with repentance because we make the decision, oh yeah, I should probably change, but it becomes superficial and surface. It needs to be motivated by the recognition of the pain that we cause others around us and the pain that we cause God in our rebellion. That we have grieved the very heart of God. That we cause hurt to those who we care about most around us. And that we are even hurting ourselves in the long term. And that unless we, we recognize the depth of that pain and that feeling, we will not be motivated to make life-lasting repentant change. So we need, we need to step out of that denial. We need to enter into the reality of the cost of our sin that we might actually be motivated by recognizing that cost to pursue God and to pursue a lifelong change. Then, having made a lifelong change, we're to be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Baptism is that symbolic act that represents the change. It expresses the change that we have made through repentance. Now the word baptism, uh, we're just going to take a quick, quick couple moments here to define it. Baptism was a word used in Jesus' time period. Baptismo is the, the original Greek word. It was used in the uh, Jesus' time period for a couple of things. The main reason or the main use of that word was when they were changing the color of a type of cloth or dyeing a cloth. They would dunk the cloth entirely into a vat of water and pull it out and the cloth would be a new color. That process of dunking the cloth into the dye was called baptismo, to submerge into something and make it new. Okay? Submerge and express a change. In a similar way, it was also used for humans. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to become part of the Jewish culture, perhaps because you wanted to marry a Jewish girl, or because you believed that there was only one God, and so you chose that you wanted to, to follow the Jewish religion and be part of their culture, you could be a Gentile who entered Judaism. There was a bunch of rituals you had to go through, a bunch of processes, some of them not comfortable and quite painful. But one of them was baptism. To become a, Je a Jew, if you were a Gentile, you had to go through a process of purification, and one step of that was to be fully submerged in water and as a, as a symbol of your purification from the sinful Gentile to the now purified Jew. And so it represented and expressed the change from Gentile to Jew, a changed life. In a similar way, even within the Jewish culture, there were those who, were, who practiced baptism. We saw that with John the Baptist, baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins, right? It was an act of purity, a changed life. You sin, now you come to us, you repent of your sin and be baptized. It's an expression of a changed life. There were sects of Jews. One group was called the Essenes. They were a sect of Jews who were focused on the scribing and copying down of the scripture. They dedicated themselves entirely to copying the Old Testament scripture, which they didn't call the Old Testament. They called it the Tanakh. But they, they focused their time and devoted their time to copying the scriptures accurately and preserving them for all of eternity. If you wanted to become an Essene, if you were really into scribing or really cared a lot about the, the consistency of the Bible being, being um, preserved over time, you could join the Essenes. But to join the Essenes, you had to go through baptism to mark a change from being outside of their very closed community to entering into their closed community. Once you were in, you couldn't leave. So that baptism was this mark of transition from one to another. So this is what baptism is all about. And even today, this is what we use baptism to be. It is to mark a transition in life. It's to express the change. 
If I am living in my sin or a cycle of depression or a cycle of addiction and I break out of that and I decide, and maybe I don't break out of it perfectly and wholly in the first attempt, but I do change the direction of my life and I'm heading towards God and I'm, I am pursuing him and I'm seeking his will, seeking to obey him and no longer just considering his command, but actually obeying his will as much as I am able, as much as he gives me strength and all of that is able through him who gives me that strength. And as I pursue God, well, then now, having made that life change, I now express it publicly in front of God and in front of a community through baptism. And so baptism is our expression of the repentant, changed life. So first, repent. Then, express that change in baptism. To the incredible credit of the crowd, 3,000 responded that way. 3,000 heard that and changed. The stats in North America is that approximately one in every 100 people, so about 1%, will respond to a message like this. So either there was 300,000 people in that crowd, 3 million people in that crowd? I didn't do the math in advance. It was an incredible response of 3,000 people responding in repentance and baptism. Now, there's a third part to this. First, we change our lives in the act of repentance. Then, we express it publicly through baptism. And then we just go back home and go back to our own lives. No, there's a third step. Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves. They gave this impossible level of devotion. They committed entirely to one another and to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching, firstly, is, is incredible. They are devoted to the apostles' teaching. Well, they want to know more about this Messiah. They want to know what this Messiah taught. And they can know because the disciples were with Jesus for three years. They learned what Jesus taught. They absorbed his teaching. And filled with the Holy Spirit, they were able to communicate Jesus' very message to the crowd and to the people. And so they devoted themselves to that teaching. Peter and the others learned from Jesus, and they had a message to share. And they were able to actually give Jesus' teaching to these people. One of the interesting things that we learned uh, or picked up in the book of Revelation as we were going through it with the young adults, was that we are not called to a new mission, but rather to continue the mission that Jesus started when he was on earth. Jesus' mission is still active, and we join into it. And so we declare Jesus' message and Jesus' mission, just as the disciples did. And we have this incredible gift that to this day, we still have the apostles' teaching. And we still have Jesus teaching that we can dedicate ourselves to and devote ourselves to. We have it recorded here in the Bible. And we live in a fortunate time where it has been printed hundreds of times, the best-selling book in all of human history, the most read book in all of human history. And we live in a fortunate time that it exists on your smartphone and, your, and the internet, and you can access the Bible literally anywhere you are 24-7. We have access to the apostles' teachings. And this early group of believers devoted themselves to these teachings. Oh, that we would devote ourselves to the teachings in the same way. That we would grasp the importance and the depth of the apostles' teachings. That we would, that we would devote ourselves, that we would devour these teachings. That we would memorize them and absorb them into our own being. That we would be able to then speak that same teaching outward. Not a new teaching, but their teaching. Jesus' words, not our own words. See, in reality, we don't ever need to come up with new theology or doctrine because it's already all here for us. It's been around for 2,000 years. Jesus taught it to his disciples and the disciples taught it to their people, to their disciples. They recorded it in this book and have passed it on throughout the ages. Theologically speaking, Christianity should be pretty boring. As in, there's nothing new in our theology. 
We shouldn't be discovering new doctrines. But rather, we should be devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching that we still have to this day recorded in the Word. And then they devoted themselves to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. I'm just going to kind of combine breaking of bread and prayer into fellowship this morning, though each one of those could be its own um, sermon. But they devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to being together. Now the word fellowship is, um, in Greek, the word is uh, koinonia, koinonia, koinonia. And in the Hebrew, that word is shalom, which you may have heard me talk about once or twice. They were committed to doing life together, to bringing whole and complete relationship, to sharing their lives with one another, to sharing all things. And they had many things to share, didn't they? And so do we. Here are some of the things that we share as Christians. We share Jesus as Lord. We share love for God. We share the guide we have to how we worship. We share our desire to worship. We share the very uh, testimony of the apostles. We also get to share in struggles, temptations, and failures, in our pain and our hardship. We share in those difficult times in our lives. And we share our victories, our call to live for him, and our joy for sharing the gospel with one another. Uh, one of the reasons why I started off by just mentioning the campfire at youth night was one, to give me an excuse to drink my tea while I was speaking, but secondly, so that you could share in the joy that we had that night answering those questions from this youth who had no Christian background, no foundation of biblical understanding. And what an incredible opportunity it was for us to be able to just share with them the incredible character, person, and nature of God. And you get to share in that gospel. You get to share in that joy. You're part of it. Even if you weren't there Friday night, you're part of it. Because we are a community devoted to one another. Devoted to one another through thick or thin, through difficulty, through health and sickness, through success or failure. We're supposed to be devoted to one another. Are we devoted to one another? North American culture, Canadian culture, is one of the most individualistic cultures in the entire world. We don't like to share our space. We like to have our own space. We don't like to share our time. We'll share it if we, you know, can schedule it in. We'll make time for you when we are able to. We don't like to share our hearts or our pains or our struggles with others. Because if we did, I mean, that would mean trusting them. That would mean actually, actually trusting that they were devoted to me in the same way that I'm supposed to be devoted to them. But we don't. We don't and, and so we, we, we don't trust that we're devoted to one another. And so we don't easily or frequently share our hearts and our pains and our struggles. And we rarely ever want others to share theirs with us. It's uncomfortable. In Canada, we are a culture that has lost sense of community in many ways. We've become very individualistic, very focused on the self, very inwardly focused. And, we get th and then we enter into communities. We need them. So we enter into, into groups, but we don't devote ourselves to that group. And when things get hard or uncomfortable, we'll just leave and go find a new group because we're not devoted and because we're not devoted, we don't feel safe to share our pains and our heart and our struggles. And others don't feel safe to share them with us because we're not devoted. We're not committed. We're not willing to, to, to stick with the group no matter what. As hard as it might get. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't leave an unhealthy community, one that is abusive or harmful. But when we come together, around the person of Jesus, we are to be devoted to one another and devoted to him. And I'm encouraged, honestly, because Brightview Church, in, in my experience, has broken the stigma or the, the reputation of many churches of not being devoted. You've heard my story, and 
you know that a couple of years ago, I was in conflict with some people in the church and that many other churches in this world would have just fired me. I'm just a youth pastor. I'm fairly replaceable. Why deal with the conflict? Just get rid of him and get a new one. And that was my experience prior to coming here. I had been fired from a church before. But incredibly, at Brightview, our value was in fellowship. Our value was that we were de devoted to one another. We were committed to one another. And so the leadership came around me. And rather than fire me, they challenged me. They kept me here. And I've, I, I've grown quite a fair amount in the past several years as a result. Because rather than just kicking me out, they worked with me and I've become more and more each day, a little bit more, the pastor that I need to be to be part of this community. So I'm encouraged by Brightview. I'm encouraged by this church. I'm encouraged by each one of you to see your devotion to each other. And yet I hope that you also hear the challenge that we are to be devoted, committed to one another. That's what we're really about. That's actually what our membership is about at Brightview Church. If you're a member of Brightview Church, that's what we stand for, to be devoted to one another. If you're not a member uh, and would like to be, this is what we stand for. That you have repented, changed your life, expressed it through baptism, and have devoted yourself to this community. This is actually what... This, this is it. This is, this is our covenant that we make as members. That's real hard to read. Maybe it's a bit small on the screen, so I'm going to read it for you. This is the covenant that we speak as members to one another. If you're a member, you've had to speak this covenant out loud. If you're not yet a member, this is what we stand for. This is our covenant. Let me read it for you. We endeavor, therefore, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, reverence for God, and godly living, to promote its spirituality in sustaining its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry and expenses of the church in its work against sin and injustice in the world, relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. We agree to promote family worship and maintain private devotions to educate our children in the teaching and practice of our faith, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk cautiously in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our life, to avoid all idle talk, backbiting, and unrighteous anger, to practice temperance in all things, and to be zealous in all our efforts, to advance the kingdom of our Savior. This is our covenant. I want to emphasize that first line. We endeavor, therefore, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love. It's not an accident that that's the very first line. Because it's in that context of walking together in Christian love that the rest of this covenant is fulfilled. We are to be devoted to one another. We are to be devoted to one another. It's an impossible fellowship. This is an impossible devotion. And yet we are called to it by God. And our ultimate call is to obey. And so by his strength, we are able to devote ourselves fully to one another. To commit ourselves to this community. To change our lives through, through repentance. Express it through baptism and then to live it out in devotion to fellowship. So I'll conclude the same way that Peter pleaded in his, in his sermon. Will you step into this changed life? Will you express it through baptism? Will you enter the impossible devotion of devoting to each other in fellowship? Will you be saved from this corrupt generation. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the invitation and the hope of repentance that life could be different. It can be different. So Lord, I pray for your strength and your courage for each one of us to obey, to ask you, what should we do? And then to act on that, Lord, to be changed, to express our dedication to you through baptism, and Lord, for the strength to come into membership, for the trust in one another, and for the devotion to one another, to flourish amongst us, that we might truly be your church. Praise the Lord.